Two years ago, even though it seems like forever ago now, as a sophomore, I was in this math class with kids my age and older. Being the awkward human being that I am and was, I was intimidated by these juniors and seniors, so I mostly kept to myself and the few friends I had in that class. See, there was this running gag in the class that a sophomore should teach the older kids, but no one ever really took it seriously. That was until one day, when I was eating my dinner, minding my own business, this boy from my class, a junior, direct messaged me on Instagram and asked me to tutor him. Being the naive 14, 15 year old that I was, I responded, of course, no problem, just tell me when. But as the conversation continued, I got the feeling that this boy didn't actually need tutoring and was messaging me for a completely different reason if you catch my drift. But again, being the naive, inexperienced 14, 15 year old that I was, I kept the conversation going. Eventually, we reached the topic of hobbies and I told this boy that I did ballet. To that, he responded, well, you totally look like a ballerina. Again, being the naive, awkward 14, 15 year old that I was, I wondered what that could possibly mean. To that, he replied, well, you're tall, skinny, and here's the pickup line you've all been waiting for, attractive. Needless to say, I didn't end up tutoring this boy or really talking to him, like at all. But uh, the last word in the pickup line isn't the important one of the story, it's the first two, tall and skinny. Now, I hope I'm not completely generalizing by assuming that we've all grown accustomed to this stereotype that we hold of ballerinas, that they tend to be on the slimmer side and have a certain height. And the stereotype isn't completely wrong. We do tend to be on the slimmer side just due to the sheer amount of exercise we do and the whole having to be lifted part of the job. But the average ballerina will probably fall around the height of 5'5 five five or 5'6, five which is actually the average height for the American woman so not really that tall. But those are just the characteristics that the general public is aware of. There are so many more that follow dancers around like a dark cloud, looming over them and their dreams of a future career. But the thing is, we didn't come up with these characteristics ourselves. It's not like all the dancers of the world got together and said, okay, this is the ideal body. No, it was the people on top the owners of the ballet companies, the modern and contemporary companies that decided for us. Although there are no official restrictions enforced by most companies, there is still an ideal body type that is looked for when holding auditions. According to Brian Nolan, writer for Dance Inform and Magazine in Australia, the ideal physique for a female classical dancer is slim, with a long neck and a short to medium length torso. The reasons behind these characteristics vary depending on who you ask, but they fall under the general consensus of it looking better on stage and making your life easier as a dancer. It's difficult when you don't fit into that, and especially when you're told at ages 10, 11, or 12 that these characteristics exist. One way or another, sometimes through the internet or <laughs> through your own teacher, Boys and girls alike begin to discover that they don't fit the image of the perfect dancer. There's two outcomes of this realization. The first is probably what you would all expect, uh, lowered self-esteem. Remember that we're talking about kids that are in their preteen and teenage years, years in which, as according to Dr. Michelle Anthony, kids are beginning to establish their identity and are becoming hyper aware of themselves and how others view them. This means that any negative reflection of themselves can only hurt them during this process and harm them during future development. And you can see this in real time if you don't believe me. Ask any dancer and they can probably tell you five to 10 things about their body that they hate. And I don't mean hate lightly. I myself have had hour long conversations with my friends talking about how I hate my long torso and my friend hates her feet. It's a strange obsession that has been ingrained in us for so long that we can't seem to shake it. Although the first outcome is important and serious, the second one is actually why I'm standing in, up here talking to you all today and talking about dancers and our weird obsessions with our torso lengths. Conforming to mediocrity. I know that sounds intense and harsh, but I think it's best explained through an example. 
I have a bad back. There's no other way that I know how to explain it. When I first started dancing, I figured I just wasn't very flexible, but come to find out, I actually have a disc bulge, which means one of the discs in my back is flattened and slightly poking into my spinal cord. I have pain every day when I sit for too long, stand for too long, lay down for too long, pretty much just being awake hurts. But the most frustrating part, at least for the dancer side of myself, is that I don't have back flexibility. I can't do jumps that require back flexibility like those, and I can't do any movements that require me holding my leg behind me like that. Yeah, pretty impressive, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> or if I can do the movements, I feel insecure about them because they don't look like they're supposed to. Very quickly, I came to the conclusion that my chances of being a professional dancer were slim to none. One, because of my body type. I don't know if you all can tell, but I'm 5'8", way over the average height for a dancer, and I have a long torso. But secondly, because I'm missing one of the characteristics that seems imperative for any dancer, flexibility. So, once I came to this conclusion, the conclusion that no, I cannot be a professional dancer, I began to associate that with also not being a good dancer. So if I can't be a professional and I can't be good, what's the point? Remember, this is all because I'm missing three of the characteristics that make up of a dancer. Back flexibility, medium height, and a short torso. But the worst part of it all is that I began to use these flaws as an excuse. An excuse for why I couldn't do certain movements or I couldn't follow along choreographies on YouTube or why I was insecure of my dancing. My recognition of these flaws, or these so-called flaws, allowed me to accept mediocrity, which is unlike me in any other scenario except for this one. I essentially created a mental roadblock for myself because of minor inconveniences. Now, it begs the question, what happens then? Well, it's unfortunate, but I can see now that what happened wasn't what should have. I didn't respond to the inconveniences in the way that I should have, potentially. But that's the issue, and that's the issue that I'm talking about here today. You know, we all have these inconveniences, things that we can't handle, things that we can't fix. But it's not about fixing them or even improving them, whatever your definition of improve may be, but about learning to compensate for them. Now, I know that sounds super harsh again and negative, but that's not the way that I want you to see it. It's more about finding an alternative path or a creative solution, if you will, to bypass a problem that cannot be solved. Let me explain this through another example that steers completely away from dance, because honestly, I'm getting kind of sick of tiring, talking about it, and you're all probably sick of hearing of it. Sometime circa 2017, these little toys started to get big on the market. You'd place them between your thumb and index finger, and they would spin, seemingly endlessly. They came in different colors and patterns, and all the kids at school and on social media had them. But these toys weren't invented for the general population of teenagers. No, they were designed for a more minuscule group. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or better known as ADHD, is one of the most common neurobehavioral disorders of childhood and adolescence, and there are more than three million cases a year. Not only does it cause difficulty in work and school, but it's also one of the largest factors in the creation of troubled relationships and lowered self-esteem. Fidget spinners, the little toys I was talking about earlier, were created for this group of people. Bear in mind that ADHD is a neurobehavioral disorder, which means that it cannot just be cured. Sure, there are medications such as Adderall that can be given to children, teens, and adults in order to curtail the symptoms of ADHD, but it doesn't just go away. So, if it can't be cured in the conventional sense, and those suffering from ADHD still have to deal with its symptoms and the detrimental effects of those symptoms, an alternative path was found. 
The act of spinning a fidget spinner alleviates some of that hyperactivity and can increase focus. However, it should be mentioned that fidget spinners have not been found to work across the board, and they should not serve as a replacement for traditional treatments such as talk therapy or medication. Nevertheless, that does not discredit the fact that some individuals have found the toys to be incredibly useful. Again, the fidget spinners aren't taking away the ADHD or its symptoms, and it should be noted that a child with ADHD generally may never fully have the attention span of a child without ADHD. However, fidget spinners can help lessen that disparity, even if it comes at a little extra work from the child with ADHD. And that seems to be the general theme for these creative solutions. They take a little extra work, more time, more energy, more money than the natural way of doing things. Yet, just because it takes more work doesn't mean it can't lead to outstanding results. But for these outstanding results to be achieved, you need to put in that extra work. And that's what I didn't realize when it came to my dancing. I knew I was never going to have a flexible back, but I didn't want to put in the work to try to bypass that anatomical fact and still be able to consider myself a good dancer. Not having a flexible back doesn't mean you can't have flexible legs or good technique, both of which are still important components to be a good dancer. If I had focused on those instead of my frustration with my back, maybe I would be more secure with myself and my dancing. I can't change the past or my perception that I had in the past, even though I wish I could, but I can change how I see things in the future. Our bodies aren't perfect, we aren't perfect, we will always want what we can't have. No matter what, you will always be missing something that could theoretically make your life easier. But just because something isn't easy or it doesn't happen naturally, doesn't mean that a greatness cannot be achieved. I was actually having this conversation with my friends earlier about whether in a perfect world where we could actually choose this, we would prefer our kids to be smart or hardworking. One of my friends argued that if you're smart, you'll get farther in life because things will be easier. And I somewhat agreed, natural talent will always lessen the load. The thing is, is that it's not a guarantee. You have all probably seen this in your lives where there's a smart kid who doesn't want to put in the work and therefore doesn't get anywhere. That's true across the board, no matter what natural talent we're talking about. Sure, the hardworking person might not have it easy, they might have to do creative and innovative things in order to catch up to the person with the natural talent. But there's nothing actually stopping them from simply being content with themselves and their talent. If there's one thing that I hope everyone in this room will get from my speech is that there's some things that we can't change, things we can't fix. For example, the past. We can't change the past, not even the bad things, no matter how much you might want to. I bet everyone in this room has a mental list of things that they wish they could just erase. But spoiler alert, you can't. So if you can't change it, what can you do? Well, from starters, you can learn from it. I'm a firm believer that every bad thing that happens, happens for a reason. A mechanism to make you stronger. A lesson, if you will. And the same thing goes for any inconvenience, no matter how minor it can be. You reflect on it, you learn from it, and you move on. Getting caught up in the things that went wrong or the things we don't have will never lead to anything productive. Life is short, too short, to spend complaining about our bad backs or our short-term memories or our long torsos because you can't change those things. But what you can change is what you do about them. Thank you, and thank you all so much for coming today.